you, you and your co-writer, the, the late Chris Bryant, wrote the script before Nicholas Rowe came on the scene. First, how did you and Chris work together? I remember, uh, I mean, what was your method? I remember reading about how Billy Wilder would pace and, and his collaborator, IAL Diamond, would type. <laughs> I don't, I, we, we just worked together like any two writers. We worked for, for some couple of years in cabaret before we started writing screenplays. And uh, in fact, the, the only reason we started writing screenplays was we tried one and we sold it for $2,000 and thought, oh, what an easy way to make money. <laughs> and then six months later, the guy who bought it from us sold it to somebody else for $75,000. And we thought, oh, this is a business we can get into. Anyway, and we'd done one film before that. Uh, and uh, and then we were hired to write this. And yes, the, the, we 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 wrote the script, and I guess uh, revisions and whatever you do in the course of the thing. And then we had a director assigned to the movie, a fellow called Larry Pierce, who was a, a good director actually, an American. Uh, and we went to Venice with Larry and the producer Peter, and and uh, we came up in Venice with the idea of the whole opening sequence partly because we were so surrounded by water and partly because we felt the film as it then stood needed that opening so that you were hopefully plugged into the dilemma of the of the couple in the short story it merely begins with them having lost a child i think in a hospital uh and they go to venice on a holiday and it was we who had the idea of changing that so that the John Baxter, the Donald Sutherland character, had a, had a job in Venice. And we just thought that rooted it better. Um, and we worked with that fellow, Larry Pierce. And, and then he left the project. I don't remember why. And the next we knew was that we would meet with Nicholas Rogue. And we'd both of us seen Walkabout and thought it was one of the great films. I still think it's one of the great films ever made. What was your first impression of Nicholas Rogue? He was funny. I know it's amazing. You look at Nick Rogue's films, and the last thing you would think about him is funny. But I promise you, that's who he is. He's he's kind of a lovely person to be around. I understand he 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 goes through the script page by page. How did that work for you? It worked well for me with this. In this instance, Nick, I've done several movies with Nick, all of which have been presented to him as fets accompli. There's the script. And the, Nick then, being an auteur, and my God, he is an auteur, as you can see from that film. I mean, he shot the script, but he added so immensely to it. Um, and the process of working with Nick on the script is he goes through every page by page. A large part of that is a process in which he becomes familiar with the material to the level that you have who've written it. And he just talks it through, really, and says, why does she say that? I mean, we analyze every single page. The only example I can give you, he, there's, a, there's a line, you probably didn't even hear it, when the two women are walking through Venice, and Nick said, I need a line of dialogue for them. I don't just want to. And we couldn't really come up with anything. They were all very anodyne. And he came in one day with three volumes of the philosopher William James and said, here, read these. It may help you with the line you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and it, actually, the line we came up with was mine. I'm rather proud of it. it just She says, the blind woman says, Milton loved this city, you know. And the reason I loved that was because Milton was blind. And there we are. But she says that to, to, uh, to the Donald Sutherland character. No, actually. she says it to her sister. Oh, maybe it's Donald. It's with Donald, you're right. It's, it's, hey, you've seen back. it more recently yes. than me. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago for you. <laughs> but yes. Um, and you, t you talk to Nicholas Rogue virtually every day. What, what did you talk about? You mean then? Well, yeah, no, then. We, we, Nick interests himself it's so much in human behavior and how people work and why they do what they do. I mean, it's just it's endless curiosity. Um, the, the one scene we never discussed with him was the love scene, and, and partly because he said, don't bother. Uh, in the script, it says, they make love. That was literally all it was. And we kept saying, you know, do you want us to write something or structure something? No, don't bother. And then he came up with this completely brilliant sequence. And the only stain on the film was 
Warren Beatty decided that he had been his, who had once been in a relationship with Julie, but was no longer. He decided that this was the most terrible thing. And he actually flew from Los Angeles to London to beat Nick up or whatever it was he thought should be done. Um, he didn't do that. But then he went to the head of Paramount to say, I want you to not distribute this film. And didn't behave particularly well over his ex-girlfriend, after all. And Julie didn't object to anything. And actually, as you look at the film frame by frame, there is nothing in it that she could possibly object to. Well, there were rumors for a while that it, that it wasn't simulated. It's, it's not only just <laughs> deeply untrue. I mean, okay, guys, how many of you could actually do it with 20 other people in the room? No, Donald Sutherland said there were only about four other people in the room. <laughs> but he also said it wasn't, it wasn't real. I mean, well, it's he, true he, there were probably only four or six other people in the room, and one of them wasn't Peter Bart, who claims that he was in the room. And that they made love. Who's Peter Bart? Peter Bart was the editor of Variety for 30 years. That's me and Variety done. <laughs> so, but the love scene, in whatever shape, was your addition, because that's not in Daphne du Maurier's story. So oh, was, no, no. A yeah. lot of it isn't in Daphne. I know, I know. A lot, not a lot of everything. But you're... Your screenplay is, is very different from the story. I mean, you had to fill things out, and, and but there's several crucial ways, and it starts starting with the opening scene. Yes. How did that come about? Because the opening scene in the in the story is they're already at that restaurant, and they're saying, don't look now, but those women over there, or yeah. whatever it is, and they've lost a child, but they've lost a child to meningitis, which is very different in so many ways. Yes. I mean, the grief is maybe the same, but the moral weight is so different to lose a child to a disease like meningitis versus drowning in plain sight, so to speak. So how did you develop, uh, not just the idea of the water, but that I, I whole think, opening? I think one of the tasks of the ad adapter into a movie is to make the emotional impact of it much greater. You can do it, curiously enough, in a book. Um, but in a movie, you have to find the beats that m make audiences or yourself go, oh, my God. And I think that's why we came up with the, with the opening. You needed to dramatize the utter vulnerability that grief brings. And I think they do it brilliantly. I love that scene in the restaurant, the first scene in the restaurant, when she collapses, having met the women in the back room. I just... It, 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 to me, the movie is about grief, and I think it's just an interesting subject. Sorry, going back to the how do we come up? the opening scene? I, I don't know. How does anybody come up with anything? You think, what can, I, what can I do to soften them up in the beginning concerning the death of a child? And we did that stuff. I, I, the one, <laughs> I mean, because Nick is such an auteur, Everybody calls this Nicholas Rogues, don't look now. And Nick is actually the first person to say that on a movie, at least 18 people consider they are the authors of the movie. I need to remark now that the cut between Julie realizing that her daughter has died and screaming and the scream of the drill in Venice was in the fucking script, okay? <laughs> So the you, love you, scene you, was not. Okay. There you, go. So you you'd like that on the record then? <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's also there's so much going on in that first scene um, in terms of the yeah. the foreshadowing and also uh, the idea that the Donald Sutherland character is has this um, this precognition precognition yeah and and looking. At, and having that figure in red in the slide in the church, which the first time it goes by, you don't even notice, but the second time is when you really see it. Yeah. And that, again, it's all, it's all that in terms of what I was saying earlier about color, it's all you. In the, in the, in the story, uh, the girl doesn't even wear red. The, uh, the mother wears red and the, and the girl wears blue. Um, the girl isn't even blonde. She's dark haired and her brother is blonde. I mean, those kinds of things. <laughs> Do you know, the truth is when you're adapting something, you read it and read it and read it, and then you throw it away. And the things that stick to the walls of your mind are the things that you then bring forward in your adaptation. It's terribly hard for me. I mean, I would give 
all credit to Daphne du Maurier because the main reason we did this and the thing that we all loved about it was that incredible idea of the ending that he has that he saw his own funeral death uh, and it was so powerful it's so powerfully done in the short story mm -hmm. and so basically once you've thrown the book away and you've forgotten I didn't remember that she died of he died of she died of meningitis. meningitis. Yeah. See, I didn't remember that. But I mean, you, 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 you keep the things that you remember and you try and incorporate them into what you're now laying over that. But even, even the son um, in the movie, he's, he's hurt in an accident, a fire drill or something. And in the story, it's, uh, again, it's a disease. It's the idea that he might have appendicitis. So there's, a, there's just an extra layer of um, arbitrariness you or know, something. You do everything you can to... to disturb I guess is really the truth uh, uh, what's extraordinary is that uh, neither Nick nor Chris Bryant nor I had we none of us really believe in precognition so we were skeptical if you like and I think it's our very skepticism that makes it work in the movie so we didn't accept it as an absolute fact we simply suggested it as an option and I mean by the time you see the movie it's kind of accepted. Yes, he has precognition. But it's, it's, because it's done skeptically, even the skeptics in the audience, are, I think, are won over by it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Well, Do Donald Sutherland likes to, to joke about himself by saying that he advised Nick Rogue that um, if you have precognition, because he was kind of interested in that kind of parapsychology, yeah. if you have it, it should be a benefit. It shouldn't hurt you. So he shouldn't die at the end. <laughs> I was present when Nick was on the phone to Donald, and Nick, we were hoping desperately that Donald would do it because we needed him. And <laughs> Donald started on with these things. And Nick listened for a few minutes, and then he said, do you want to do the fucking movie, or do you want to talk about it? <laughs> and Donald said, well, I'd like to talk about it. And Nick said, then, then I don't want to work like that. And Donald said, oh, I'd rather do the movie, and shut up. I mean, he was wonderful. How about that wig, by the way? Do you know why he wanted to wear a wig like that? No. <laughs> it was just a look of the early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> um, about the, I think, I don't know about you all, I think it's the almost the only thing that makes the mo gives the movie a date is that young Donald Sutherland. Because you don't get it from the setting. Obviously, you don't get it from the setting. And I, I don't know, it, just, it seems to me an undated movie, except for the childlike Donald Sutherland. <laughs> and the I ran into Donald. <laughs> Years later, he made a movie called JFK. And I ran into I thought I hated the movie. And I ran into him and I, and I said, oh, Donald, oh my God, you just did JFK, didn't you? And I'm a terrible blabber. And <laughs> he said, yeah, what did you think? I said, I want every movie from now on to have you appear two thirds of the way through and tell us what's been happening. Which is exactly what he did. He has seen. He sits down on a park bench and he does a resume of everything. <laughs> Sorry, that's nothing to do with this movie. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> you, you also introduced. I mean, you introduced other elements such as uh, Donald Sutherland's work. You, you made him, uh, Very it, much it, so. as you say yeah. in, the, in the story, there just tourists to Venice. But it, you give him a job as a restorer and an architectural historian. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. I mean, there are so many details that would seem to. That impinge on the movie, even just that sign. Uh, that, that well, I think the two the two big um, elements we introduced after you're in Venice is Donald as as an architectural restorer. So that there was a real reason for them to be there on a slightly more ongoing basis, and the other element was the bishop. I think the bishop's an absolutely wonderful character with a great performance. By the way, Nick cast all those actors locally, and including the two women. No, Hilary Mason was English, but the, the, the non-blind sister was an Italian, English-Italian woman. I think they're terrific, all of them. I asked him once, I said, how did you reject the actors that you saw for the dwarf? And he, he said, well, I told them I wanted somebody a little taller. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> You, so you you added the um, the, the oh the bishop I'll, I'll get back to the restorer because that's a, the bishop is such an ambiguous character because yeah. on one hand um, I mean does he even care about the the the, the building at one point uh, the Donald Sutherland says you know he doesn't 
he doesn't care about this restoration. And but then the bishop says, you know, these mosaics are so wonderful, and they've been in my, they've been making it for my family for two hundred years. And then crunch, he's sort of stomping along, crunching over those mosaics. Yeah, but the <laughs> crucial moment in that scene is when the bishop moves under the falling scaffolding with his arms outstretched to catch something. And also, I, you know, I think we. But you introduced a- that scene too. You introduced the whole scaffolding thing. Oh, we introduced it but for the simple reason. I was reading the script one day, and I said, "You know, Chris, it gets boring in the middle. <laughs> we need to do something to chirp it up a bit." And we couldn't think what the hell to do. And then we said, "Oh, wait a minute. He's an architectural restorer. We'll put him on a scaffolding." And uh, and that's how that whole thing. And it's wonderful because when you come up with that completely mechanistically. And then you think, well, now there must be ways in which we can layer this into the rest of the movie, which I love. And, you know, just that fragmentary shock, shot of the bishop sitting upright in bed as he's killed. It's wonderful. I mean, we would never have had that without, without the without scaffolding, scaffolding collapse. And just a sidebar, uh, Donald Sutherland himself did this stunt because apparently the, the stunt man refused to do it because the insurance wouldn't cover it in case anything happened to him. And so Sutherland, who says, claims to be afraid of heights, did it. He was wearing a harness, I promise. Yeah, no, no, I know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but even so. <laughs> You're not impressed? Uh, no, no, I think it's wonderful when actors do their own stunts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you think it's a lie? No. But I, I sense skepticism. It's just us. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no, I'm sure if he said he did his own stunt, he did. I wasn't there that day. <laughs> I was watching the scene from the two days before, which was about a scaffolding collapsing. No. <laughs> uh, you, you worked with, um, with Nicholas Rogue on five films, so you obviously enjoyed the collaboration. But yeah. what's it like to work with someone who so emphatically declares his preference for image over words? He does, and yet he's terribly respectful of words. I mean, Nick has sort of so many random geniuses to him. I, I never much liked The Man Who Fell to Earth. And then the other day I watched it again, and I said to him afterwards, I said, Tell me why did you cast David Bowie? He said, if you're casting a man from outer space, can you think of a better person to cast? And actually, you can't. I mean, that's a brilliant concept. And so he's brilliant at casting. Uh, and and he, yes, you're right, he's brilliant with imagery. Uh, by the way, I still think it's time to remake The Man Who Fell to Earth because poor Nick never had enough money to do any special effects in that movie. Such a great story. What do you think about the idea of a remake of Don't Look Now? I don't really mind. I mean, if somebody wants to put Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. <laughs> I'll bet they make some serious mistakes. But we all do. But in particular? No, I don't mind at all. Did you? I was actually asked if I would do the, the screenplay. And I thought probably there was no upside to that. Do you know who the director is yet? Is no. Did you and Chris change your screenplay a lot in response to, to Nicholas Rogue's direction with this? Yes, but only in very small ways. Um, no, you don't really do much. Well, I'm trying to think. In, in, the, in The Witches, sorry, I know I'm not talking about Don't Look Now, but in The Witches, uh, we made, it was incredibly faithful to the, to the book. And then one day I met Roald Dahl and he said, why did you have the parents of this child die in the opening 10 minutes of the film? I said, page 133 of your book, sir. They die. And he was kind of just grumpy about the whole idea of making The Witches as a movie. We were so faithful, but while shooting, we realized that the ending had to be changed. Because when you change the medium, everything else changes. In the book, the little boy, I'm sorry to be talking about another movie, the little boy remains at the end of the story. He remains a mouse. And he's going to be a happy mouse forever in a story. That's absolutely fine. But once you see this child and you are with this child and you know who he is and his parents are, you can't leave him as a child, as as a mouse. So we had to invent another witch who turned him back into a little boy. 
And Dahl was furious. Fuck him, I say. <laughs> well, he's dead, so he can't be. Yeah, but he wouldn't sell me Matilda. <laughs> so, so the idea that dialogue is secondary, secondary doesn't disturb you as a Not in the man least. who makes no, dialogue. No, because I think if you're making movies and you're depending on your dialogue, you're probably not making movies. I always <laughs> used to say, I used to say to young writers, if you find yourself struggling to describe a sunset, I think you should change your vocation. T tell me more about your other collaborations with, with Nicholas Rogue. Uh, Cold Heaven was based on a novel by Brian Moore. We loved Cold Heaven, Nick and I. Um, I. We both read the book, and I went off and wrote the screenplay. And I said, we can never get this movie made. And he said, wait a minute. He said, if Francois Truffaut can persuade audiences that aliens get out of their spacecraft and come and say hello to Francois Truffaut, sorry, if Spielberg can do that, then we can write a movie in which our leading character has a vision of the Virgin Mary at the end. I was wrong. <laughs> and nobody saw the movie, but we loved it. It was a wonderful movie with, with his then newish wife, Teresa Russell, who is an, the nicest human being on the planet. But I was producing that film and Teresa discovered craft services during the early part of that film. And I knew that the last scene we would shoot was Teresa in a bathing suit. <laughs> How do you say to your director and the spouse of your leading lady, lay off the craft services? <laughs> Incredibly difficult. Could, can you shoot the bathing, the bikini first? We couldn't do, no. You couldn't, you couldn't shoot. That. Actually, we had a terrible accident with that. One of the stuntmen, uh, who was supposed to be decimated by a boat, uh, got decimated by a boat. And by the grace of God, we had two underwater cameramen below shooting up. And they were able to get him, he, he was sliced by the propeller. And they were able to get him onto the surface of the water. And within, literally within seven minutes, we had him in a hospital. And he recovered just fine. Um, and what was lovely was in the editing, I said to Nick, well, at least you've got an incredible shot of the boat killing Mark Harmon. And Nick said, I would never use that shot in a million years. Film is about creating an idea or an illusion and I'm absolutely not going to use a piece of documentary exactly, footage yeah. to do it. What about Castaway? That's another film you made in uh, 1986 with, uh, with Nick Rogue. Yes. I, I like Castaway. Castaway was... A, it was, was based a, on a, a memoir by Lucy Irvine? It was Irvine? based on a memoir by, by a woman called Lucy Irvine. And, uh, I mean, I really have nothing to say about it. It was just the idea of, of a, two people on a desert island who think it's incredibly romantic and interesting. And, in fact, it turns out to be a complete disaster, um, as, as I suspect it probably would be. We never could find an ending for that story. And one day I, I was... The, the girl who wrote it, I said, uh, I said, tell me, what did you do after you left the island? I said, did you have money? How did you get back to England? And she said, I became a prostitute. And I thought, oh my God, that's an ending. <laughs> but we decided it would be unkind to use it, so we didn't. Two Deaths, that's your, that was your uh, last collaboration. Two Deaths. With Nicholas Rowe. Can I just tell you about Oliver Reed in Castaway? Sure. Oliver Reed was very proud that he had a tattoo on the most intimate part of his anatomy. And he would show it to you at the drop of a, <laughs> a bra. <laughs> and he was actually, he was a wonderful man. He was completely drunk half the time. And I, sitting in London, I wasn't on the island a lot when they were shooting it. Sitting in London, you could tell from the dailies which were shot in the morning and which were shot in the afternoon. And yet I honestly believe Ollie was one of the great British actors of his generation. He really was just quite magnificent, the empathy that he brought to that character. Okay. Two Deaths, anything on that? That was based on a novel by Stephen Dobbins. Two Deaths was a novel set in South America. And partly because we're Europeans, we thought South America was too far away. So we set it in Romania, which was having its revolution at that time. And, um, no, I have not a lot to say about it. I mean, Michael Gambon was absolutely brilliant, as he always is. And Sonia Braga, I wonder if you remember Sonia Braga. Mm -hmm. 
she was she was Mr. Redford's girlfriend for a long time. In fact, during that period. Alexander Walker described it as a filmed radio play. I suspect it was. You also adapted Pat Barker's Regeneration, her Booker Prize winning novel, uh, with Jonathan Price. What was that process like? It was very. Uh, this was not with Nicholas Rogue. No, I'm very, very proud of that movie. I think it was hugely underrated, immensely powerful film. Uh, I won't bore you with the story of it, but. Essentially, it was about the psychiatrist who was dealing with men who were shell-shocked and who himself becomes shell-shocked through his empathy with the men he's dealing with. Uh, and two of the men are the two great war poets, Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. And I really, really like that movie. Jonathan Price played the psychiatrist and he was just brilliant. You were a producer on that movie. Did that affect your relationship with the it's being made? Or no, and I always did the same thing when I produced movies that Nick directed as well as that one. If you go on the set and an actor takes you aside and says, can I discuss that scene where? You always say, I'd really like to talk to you about it, but talk to the director first. And that saves you a lot of grievance. Have you ever wanted to direct? No. More recently, you've been involved in writing and producing stage plays, such as, as I mentioned earlier, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. What what took you there? I don't know. I just had a good idea. I thought one day that Priscilla would make a, f a fun musical. And uh, just for, just for McGill alumni, uh, uh, Alan was involved with the Red and White Review. Well, there are no McGill alumni here. I don't. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. <laughs> I just loved the idea of doing Priscilla as a stage musical. And we had a wonderfully happy run here at the uh, Princess something theatre. Princess? Princess of Wales. Princess of Wales theatre. Um, yeah. It's been running for nine years now around the world. And and next year, it's starting, it's, it's, uh, it's starting to run on one of the big cruise lines. And <laughs> I don't know if you any, if any of you saw it, but it's got a full-size bus on it. <laughs> which I think we're turning into a pram. <laughs> well, some of those cruise ships are pretty big, yeah. think, actually. Uh, what, what interested you in doing uh, William Styron's Sophie's Choice as a play? Uh, Sophie's Choice has never been done in the stage, um, and Styron himself didn't particularly want it done on the stage. Uh, and after he died, his widow was persuaded by a writer called David Rintels, who wrote a really, really fine script. And I'm in the midst of trying to appoint a director to mount it for Broadway. And uh, we're having chats with, even with Canadian theatres about it. Uh, I think it's probably going to be huge because it's one of the most searingly powerful emotional experiences you can have, so much so that I raised the investment for it in about 48 hours. But but one of the investors that I had targeted said, no, it's too depressing, it's going to be too painful, audiences won't go to it. He may prove to be right, I hope he isn't. And you're involved in something relating to Mordecai Richter's work. Do you feel a particular affinity to Canada? Or, or well, are we just knew, busy claiming you? I, I feel a particular affinity to Canada, and I knew Mordecai. Not well, but I knew him uh, well enough. And I was asked to adapt uh, an early novel of his called Son of a Smaller Hero, uh, which is, like much of Mordecai's work, semi-autobiographical. And I really enjoyed it so much that one day I foolishly volunteered to do a, a, a play about Mordecai's life. And foolishly enough, some theatre in Montreal has agreed to mount it. So there we are. And I was, I was reading somewhere that you're, well, you bought the rights something like 20 odd years ago to Walter Tevis's novel, The Queen's Gambit. Yep. And, and I've worked on that with several directors. None of it worked out fine. It's a brilliant, brilliant book about a child chess genius. Tevis wrote The Man Who Fell to Earth, The Hustler, The Color of Money, and this book, The, the Queen's Gambit. And he, it's just an extraordinary book about addiction, success, failure, all those things that happen in lives. And uh, the last director I had working on it was working 
on what would have been his first movie, and we had just started to cast it when he died, and his name was Heath Ledger. And the lovely thing about Heath, he's a very nice man, <laughs> was if I had a little part to cast, you know, a two-day shoot, he would say to me, oh, let me, let me call up Gary Oldman, he'll do that for me. It was really comforting having a director who could do that. Was he going to be in it too? He was going to do a small part in it, yeah. yeah. But you're still trying anyway, to Anyway, so you're now still I'm trying to, trying to find made. another Heath Ledger. Yeah. How many projects on the go do you have right now? Six. <laughs> that was fast. I don't know. <laughs> We're going to open up to questions. Please wait till the microphone comes to you. I just saw somebody leaving with wearing a red cap. Did you have anything to do with the red in the movie? I mean, no. it's so amazing. The uh, if you notice, when they red shows up whenever there's danger, and when they're pulling the body out of the water, there are these school kids wearing red caps. Mm -hmm. um, at the very end of the film, at the funeral cortege, uh, such as it is, the son has a is wearing a red cap. It's just yeah. question where the red light is. Hello, I don't know. If seem like it's on oh. I, I can oh can I can hold project. it close <laughs> um I'm just wondering what you're so you've worked with a writing partner and you've worked solo can you talk about what the process is working with a writing partner versus writing by yourself sure. what two things uh f first of all I think all beginning writers in our field generally should try and work with a partner. It's just a hell of a lot easier. And you have each other to encourage each other. Uh, secondly, I prefer writing on my own, but only because once you're grown up and you know the techniques that you learn through working with partnership, it's easier to apply them without having to justify them. And also you learn how to edit yourself in a way that you probably wouldn't have done if you hadn't worked with a partner. And the other time to work with a partner is comedy. I don't think, it, I, mean, I think it's almost impossible unless you're Woody Allen to write comedy on your own. But writing with somebody else makes it a lot easier and a lot more fun. Is the microphone landing here? I thought it was an amazing movie, absolutely phenomenal from start to finish. Um, there's the, a murder loose in Venice, we understand that. And I'm just wondering, when he goes to visit the police chief, the scene goes on for several minutes, and I've noticed the police chief, he's twitching, he's looking, it's just like, is that, quote, a red herring? I, I think what it was, was Nick absolutely adored the actor playing the police chief. And he was he was giving so much. He him and the and the hotel manager were the two actors. <laughs> um, and I, and I, wasn't that amazing the way Nick staged it? So that as Donald comes into the room, the guy is reading a book and you can't see his face. And he has, I love that. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you know? I'm slightly embarrassed about the whole notion of the murderer on the loose in Venice. Such a red herring. It's not structurally part of any good story. You wouldn't do that unless Daphne du Maurier had written it and it was there. But given that it was there, no, I don't... Yeah, I guess it was a red herring, isn't it? But he's looking for his wife is what he's doing at that point, no? Mm -hmm. well, that's, so that's not so much a red herring. And they're concerned with the, with the, with the, uh, the murders. And, and they and have the, somebody the, the actor him. The actor didn't speak English. Yeah. And then, and then they have one of his subordinates, police officers, following him and we're thinking, is that the murderer? And why are they following Donald Sutherland? For his safety. Uh -huh. okay. They should have stayed with him. <laughs> Do you know that ending, by the way, just apropos, came up in the cutting room. The whole of the idea of that collage of everything as Donald dies was in the cutting room. Nobody planned that. It wasn't in the screenplay. It wasn't in Nick's mind. And the editor said, why don't we just intercut a whole lot of what happened to him? And I think it's just wonderful. It's like a symphony. Isn't the score good, by the way? First time, first time that guy had ever written a score. And by the way, I'm on the soundtrack. 
Nick said, I need somebody who plays the piano like a child. <laughs> That's you? <laughs> also, the, the actor playing the police chief, uh, or the police inspector, I didn't speak English, so apparently he would often put the emphasis on the wrong word, to, which also made it even creepier, you know, because he didn't speak in any kind of natural way. <laughs> There's another question there. Uh, one of the many departures from the short story has Julie Christie's character return for the climax of the film. And I was wondering if that was a concession to Julie Christie's star power of the time or if you and Chris uh, felt that heightened the tension or served a story purpose in the film. The return when she's hunting for him, you mean? Julie Christie returns to yeah. Venice, not yeah. just for the funeral, but for yeah. the climax of the movie. Yeah. Um, I honestly think it was a sort of natural outcome of the movie that we were then writing. Um, it, I mean, she couldn't just come back for the funeral. It seemed to us more sensible. And, and also, I think it's one of the important things about the love scene. We're talking about a, a happy marriage here. God knows they're living with grief, but they're two good people. And the idea that she gets back to Venice and tries to find him as soon as she can so they can fall into each other's arms is, is kind of more a moving idea. So I guess it was done for the film, yeah. Up there. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, adapting something as intangible as tone, that sort of sense of menace and uh, sort of uncanniness. Uh, it's so, so different when you read it in a story and uh, how you sort of adapted that feeling into uh, a screenplay. You know, place. once you know the genre of the film that you're gonna do, and if it's this kind of genre, you do as much as you can to, to discomfort and to just everything should be slightly, slightly offbeat without being weird. Um, and then you honestly just d develop things as best you can in ordinary, conventional, structural, thriller-ish ways. Um, I, I was always worried that the, the tension went out of the film when she goes to England to tend to her child. I mean, somehow or other, I think we managed to keep it together more or less. But it's, it's actually quite a dangerous thing in a film. In, in, you know, as you're galloping towards your end, to have somebody say, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to go to England and look at this little boy in the prep school and then come back. Um, so you just do all the things you can to, uh, to not to shock, but to, uh, to remind the audience that life is scary. And there's a lot of shit out there that you have to avoid. If I understood correctly, you changed your surname, and I'm wondering if there's an intriguing storyline to no that. Intri no intriguing story. I told Eleanor, um, I was at McGill, and I was on something called Dean's List, which meant that I wasn't allowed to do uh, um, extracurricular activities. And somebody in their wisdom, um, I did a cabaret act with my co-writer, who was a law professor. And <laughs> we did a cabaret act at school, and we were talent spotted, and I was asked if I would be willing to accept $500 a week to appear at the El Morocco. And I had to conceal my identity. And I tried to think of a good Scottish patriotic name, and Scott was the best I could come up with. How did you come to be at McGill? I was accepted into Cambridge, St. John's College, Cambridge, to study English. And in May, I discovered that the study of English at McGill in those days ended in 1540. Uh, the study of English at Cambridge. I'm sorry, Cambridge. Yeah, I yeah. Remember. Study of um, English at Cambridge ended in 1540. So I had to scurry around and find some university that would teach me English in a better way. And McGill was it, and it would accept me, and I ran. And I didn't know a single person in Canada. We had very tight restrictions on money in those days. And uh, I, it was the happiest three years of my life. I really adored the academic courses. I got involved in the Red and White Reviews and the Players Club and everything else and, and, and the McGill Daily, including getting sued for a very serious libel. We accused the local politician of being bribed. 
we, of course, recused ourselves from the accusation. But he lies in his grave knowing that somebody knows. And, and you were actually embraced by uh, immigration, you said, when you first arrived on, on yes, our shores. Yes, I had this extraordinary experience. I took the boat from, from Glasgow, and, and uh, the customs and immigration people come on the boat uh, two days before you arrive, or a day before you arrive, and they clear you on the boat. So it's great. When you land at Montreal, you just exit. And the guy I had looked at me and said, so what's all this student? You're going to be a student? I said, yeah. He said, here, you got a student visa. I said, yeah. He said, ah, oh, bullshit. He said, I make you a landed immigrant. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> so here am I illegally in your country. Sorry. Over there. Because of your long history in filmmaking, I'm tempted to ask this question. Apart from technical advances and, and that uh, mechanical sort of thing, what would you say are some of the major differences in film now and when you started out or when you made this one? Do you know, I, if I can slightly duck the question but put it in a different way, because I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer, but I tell young writers now that I believe the next serious move forward in computer technology, we will be making movies. We won't be writing them. And I really believe that will happen within the next 10 to 15 years. So, and, and then if you wish to have Brad Pitt play your lead, you make a deal with him and you put his face on your avatars. But basically, we will be making movies in almost every day. And a lot of writer-directors are doing that now. And the sad thing is that many of them are better directors than they are writers. Uh, I'm leading a single-minded single, camp single -minded campaign to stop newspapers, critics, and Eleanor Wachtel from describing films with the possessive credit to the director. I think it's completely unfair. Uh, I, I, I once, many years ago, made the point at a similar gathering where Robert Bolt had written a very wonderful play called The Man, of, Man for All Seasons. And it toured the world, it was everywhere. And then Fred Zinnemann directed the movie and by contract it was called Fred Zinnemann's Man for All Seasons. It's so preposterous and so offensive to the other pe people who contribute. Not just the writers, but the designers and the editors and the camera, I mean, and the actors. Uh, I, if I can prevent one person from using the possessive apostrophe over a film's title, I will have, I will have triumphed, Eleanor. <laughs> okay, but how have movies changed in the last 40 years? Never mind looking ahead. Just well, but that's a huge change. Well, that we'll actually make the movies. No, no, but, but from 40 years ago to now, from 1973 I don't know. The picture's steadier. The costs are a great deal higher. Uh, or lower if digital, or still higher? I don't know. I have, I have two scripts at the present time that I'm as proud of as anything I've written. And in both cases, the studio said the same thing to me. We really like it if you can make it into a franchise. Well, fuck it. I like them the way they are. And, and I do think, I think, they've, I think that whole franchise thing is going to go on for years, but it's incredibly damaging. It's keeping other movies out of, the, out of the way. I mean, I get all the videos of all the movies made in a year through the Academy. And, and I'm quite diligent about watching them. And every year I'm staggered how few good, sensible, ordinary, grown-up movies there are. I'm not taking anything away from Hunger Games, it's fine. Or from Iron Man, I actually enjoy them. But that's the biggest change in movie making. You no longer get individual voices or groups of people making <laughs> movies. Last question, if there is. Actually, just to follow from what you were just talking about, uh, if Don't Look Now is in fact remade today, what sort of concessions to the realities of Hollywood today would you think need to be made for that movie to get made today? That's fun. How do we make Don't Look Now a franchise? 
Well, we start by getting rights in Venice, I think, is the first thing we do. I don't know. I don't know because I don't really want to speculate on it. I bet you it's really good. And I'll bet you... By the way, there was a there was a theatre play adaptation of it, which I didn't go to see, but it was quite well reviewed, which kind of pleased me because it means there's a certain coherence to the story that would work in another medium. I tell you something. I think I I answered I answered some questions for uh, uh, some journalists. When we made Castaway in the uh, Pacific. At the end of the shoot, no, halfway through the shoot, I said to Nick, I've come across the most wonderful unpublished manuscript set also on this island, or an island very similar. I'd like to try and make it, write it. We could shoot it right after this movie using the same crew in three weeks. We never did in the event. You could, however, see that movie almost scene for scene in a film called Castaway, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Tom Hanks. Now, I don't know if my screenplay wandered into the world or if great minds simply think alike, but everything in that Castaway was in the movie that I wrote for Nick to do after, after our Castaway. And by the way, our Castaway has never been issued on DVD. I wonder why. Just a quick, uh, an odd question. Um, you, you write for theater and you write screenplays, more screenplays than theater, I think. Yeah. With the Mordecai Richler play, why a play rather than a screenplay? Well, I wrote the. You screen wrote the screenplay about, about. I wrote the, the screen adaptation of his book. Right, but about his life, did you? I just was interested in his life, and uh, and you know, I, and it, and it's all kind of in the title, which Mord you, Mordecai used. The, um, I, I'm sure they're going to change, especially Florence, poor thing. I'm, it currently is called World Famous in Toronto, which is what he said about himself, and I thought it was a kind of brilliant observation, although he was quite well known in England too. And Have Italy, I got myself Italy. in enough trouble? He was huge in Italy. Barney's was version it? was a great success in Italy. Barney's version? Yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> Anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for coming, and My thanks pleasure. to everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you.